Well, Stanley, it's um, a great pleasure to, to be in conversation with you. This will be our second conversation, but our first official conversation. Right. Um, you, um, you like conversation, don't you? Or do you prefer monologues? I, I like conversation, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't do many conversations, but yeah, I like conversation. With you, I like conversation. Would you say your work is a conversation? Would you say your painting is a conversation? Or is well, you know, it's, I mean, it, it creates a conversation. The work creates a conversation. Who, who, who would you say your paintings are in conversation with? Well, I think the paintings are really, uh, with anyone, I think the color and the painting creates conversation. So they're meant to be lived with, they're meant to be lived with more than looked at, you know, I mean, as opposed to this, I mean, people live with them. I think people are going to live with them. So how they, how they create conversation, I think, is interesting to me. Um, what about the conversation inside you with art, with culture, with race in America, with history? Oh, that's a big that conversation one. out of you, <laughs> that's out a, of which the paintings come. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, that, that, that's, I, sort of like, that's sort of how what influences the painting. Yeah, so that's a big conversation. I mean, uh, yeah, that conversation big um, in the, the making of them, the titling of them. Um, so, yeah, that's a big conversation. The only reason I asked that question is because Yeats, uh, the great Irish poet, said, um, out of conversation with others uh, comes rhetoric, out of conversation with ourselves comes poetry. Yeah. And then he had a different dictum about 10, 20 years later. Um, and what did he say to I think he more or less said the opposite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense. It makes sense. As if, you don't, if you don't contradict yourself, it doesn't make sense. Has your, do, do you want to just tell us about your artistic genesis? Because I think a lot of people here know your work uh, and know, your, know of your extraordinary reputation and your place in the, uh, in the, in the living American canon, but might not know actually where you came from or how you stumbled into or deliberately walked into the terrain of art? Well, it's a long, it's a long conversation. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I was always an artist. I always drew all the time. You know what I mean? I mean, I sort of felt... Um, Did you draw as a child? Yeah, constantly. In fact, I drew... I, I drew all the time and in kindergarten. Well, in the States, you go to kindergarten and then first grade. And so I could draw all the time in kindergarten, but then I had to go to first grade and have to start to read, which was a real, uh, I didn't want to read. Uh, so I, I, I sort of felt like I spent my time from then to, to I got to art school looking out the window. Um, I, I, like was the always, I was always absorbed in the visual. I was always the visual person, you know, so I was always uh, that. I always was involved with looking out the window. Uh, that's the second time you mentioned window. Yeah, I know. Anyway, so that, that's what I, you know, so, but later, but I started really getting involved, I didn't get involved with reading really until uh, maybe last year in high school, really, you know. Because high school, they never brought us up. We were never, we were never talked about. Where'd you go to high school? Uh, outside of Philadelphia, near Philadelphia. So, so, what, so what was your first quietly explosive encounter with art outside of the drawing that you were doing? Art school. Uh, not into art school. Uh, not into art school that I really start realizing, you know, seeing things. I mean, I knew I wanted to go to art school, but I didn't know what that meant. You know, and then um, when I went to art school, then I felt I was really, you know, home. You know, so that, because then I could do art all the time. And I, so I, went to, I was very poor, so I went to art school thinking I was going to be an illustrator, make some money, and... Because even when I was young, they used to, in those days, in the 50s, in uh, newspapers, you could have, you know, illustrations, and I could do that. They said, and from my neighborhood, they said, oh, you draw up those things, you can make a lot of money. I thought, oh, I can do that, you know, so that's what I was going to do, you know. And then you had record covers, and, you know, all that kind of things when you're young, you think, I can do that, you know. So you thought, well, I'd go to art school, we'll learn that, make the money. So I, I didn't know about painting or uh, what that was, you know, so... But once I got the painting, uh, I fell in love immediately. Who was the first few painters that made you fall in love with painting? 
Who was Cezanne, it? Cezanne was the first Cezanne. one. Cezanne. Yeah. Practically uh, the father of abstraction. Yeah, Cezanne right away. Uh, Cezanne and uh, Edmund Monk, who were still um, two of my favorite painters. So that they, 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 I fell in love with those right away. Those people. And then, you know, you build on other things. But those were the two that, that I fell in love right away and I still am in love with. I want to leap forward before I go back a little bit. We, we met through a, com- a conversation. Yeah, so that was because, the Because yeah. David, David Hammonds um, sent a request across the pond that he wanted to have a conversation with me. You know why? Carry on. Why? Okay, because, I, you know, I read the book Famish Road, right? And David was going to, we were, David and I were in Rome together. And David was going to do a piece with Cornelis, but he didn't know what he was going to do uh, at, at, the, at the American Academy. So I gave David your book. So you're responsible for this conversation? Yeah. And, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, David, and David read that, because David didn't know what he was going to do, and David uh, read that book, and then he did a piece of, uh, in, in the tent uh, with uh, an African sculpture with sand coming out, as opposed to water in, in the States. So that book was a real inspiration for David uh, to do that. And then we always talked about you, and uh, we always wanted to meet you. And, uh, and then when I did meet you, what happened was I'd have dinner with David, and, and David said, uh, someone's going to come. I said, well, who? who's going to come? He said, oh, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. And then you showed up. So, <laughs> so my question is, tell us about your friendship with David Hammonds. I mean, you're two quite different artists. You share a, kind well, of, we're, we're, you share a similar <laughs> stance in terms of the courage of your standing outside and inside at the same time. Just t- tell us about... Well, I, you know, David and I, we were, we were friends for a long time. We're not so much friends anymore. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, really. But we were friends... Uh, we, we were... We were uh, why not? I don't know why. I don't know. <laughs> we have to fix that. Yeah, fix that. Anyway, but uh, we knew each other for a while in New York, but then we both came to Rome. Uh, and uh, that sort of sealed our conversation, uh, our, our friendship. And we sort of traveled together since then. We were very influential to one another. People found it kind of odd because of what I do and what he does. But uh, in terms of our mental conversation, we, 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 we used to talk every, every week on the phone. Even now, we don't anymore. But anyway, we were really, uh, those, those were good years. Those were early years. I sort of meant, I, I always think I knew David Hammonds before he became David Hammonds. You know what I mean? Before he became David Hammonds. And maybe he knew you before you became Stanley Whitney. Yeah, definitely, definitely. He definitely knew me before I became Stanley Whitney. So you're both... You're both you're I'm both not quite Stanley Whitney yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, he is definitely David Hammonds. <laughs> what, what do you think it'll take for you to become Stanley Whitney? Because I think... I, I, I know, uh, it's, it's like believing that you are Stanley Whitney. Well, I, I, we all think, we all know your style. I know you all believe it, but I, uh, it's for me to believe it. Anyway, I'm, I, I don't know if it's a good idea if you do believe it, to tell you the truth. You, know, um, you think I, the uncertainty and the doubt is Well, I think, you know, I think, you know, for so long I, was sort of, I could be someplace no one, and I'd be invisible, you know what I mean? So it's odd, it's odd, to, be, it's odd to be visible. So you could go somewhere, you could go... Because, you know, for me, I like to go look at art. I look, like, like to look at art a lot. So it's, it's odd for me to go look at art and someone, you know, walks up to you and knows who you are. I mean, you know, as an artist, you, you, you should be invisible. I mean, when I taught, I taught art school and people, like, you could have artists could come, artists could be in an audience like this and the art students wouldn't even know they were there because it was before the internet, before that. So you could have, you could be in uh, some place, some artist giving a lecture, another artist could be in the audience and the student wouldn't, art students wouldn't even know. So, but now, because of all the media, people know who you are, what you look like, you know, and they know all about you. So it's very different. So uh, that's all kind of new to me, and, uh, you know, it's just the way it is. That's, and it's not, a, it's not it's, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing, you know. I'm, I'm happy to be, people love the work, you know. Well, we, we absolutely do, and yeah. I've, got a, I've got a question about numbers for you. No, I'm not good at numbers. Go ahead. <laughs> you're, you're, you're really good at these numbers. Okay. You're really good at these numbers. 96, <coughs> which comes to 15. 
which comes to 6, 72, which comes to 9, 60, which comes to 6, 4, which comes to 10, 20, which comes to 2, or 12, which comes to 3. Why those numbers? No idea. No idea where you are. No idea. The, the, these are the seven um, size squares that you tend to limit yourself to. Oh, that, that, that's because, um, you know, it's, it's like everything else I do, it's kind of felled out. I mean, um, some, of, some of it's just odd, like the small, like the small paint, the 12 by 12. Yeah. Um, that was something, the little paintings happened because um, there used to be an old art supply dealer in New York, David Davis. I used to buy art supply, and one time I went to get some paint, and he had a, a bunch of little canvases stretched up in a box, you know, and I thought, oh, those are interesting. And so I took, took a couple, and I just painted them. And I painted them, you know, sort of like, again, like the end of the day, I just painted these little paintings. And, um, it was on, an, the, it, on those small cameras. On those small cameras. It was like, a, you know, you're always looking to expand your practice. And I was thinking, well, this might be... In, in a way, you let things, you open things up so things come to you. You know what I mean? So these little canvases, so I started making these little canvases. Uh, and then the square paintings, the way it got to square was, I didn't really want that... Um, I, was, I didn't want that... Uh, landscape, you know, the, the wide landscape. Yeah. And then I was in Rome, uh, and I just wanted to go something more classical. And actually the square uh, was more of a challenge because uh, I wanted to have things be, have a good rhythm. In a rectangle, I can move, 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 move. Uh, but in a square, it's really uh, difficult to get a good rhythm. And so it's a real challenge to have that kind of really tight so it's, a, so it's a limitation. The limitation, okay. really tight space. And so sort of like just really condense it. And it was really for the drama, you know, to have that, because you really want to have that drama uh, in art. So that was what that is. Now, uh, like there's a painting I have in, in Freeze. It's a long painting. Uh, that's something I went back to. So, you know, as you get older, you have your own history too. So I can sort of go back and look at my own, own history yes. And re rethink about it, and um, so um, I, I, I first, you know, the paintings were really about space in terms of a landscape. But when I was in Rome and went to Europe and Rome, then the architecture came into it. If we just take the uh, the beautiful accident of this painting right here behind us, yeah, yeah. Um, when I look at that painting. My first feeling is that I need to look at that painting a hell of a long time. Yeah. I feel I need to understand the, the relations between the colors. Some of those gaps, some of those canvas points, as it were, Cezanne-like, that sort of comes out in the edges of the colors. I'm fascinated by the drapes. Um, the, it, the intercalation of upper and inner colors, and the, the dialogue of the colors be, be, beside one another. When you look at a painting like this, what emotions went into well, you the know, making? From, from, you know, for me, when I look at my paintings, I think about, oh, I could make them better. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's hard for me. When I look at my paintings, I, I, I think about all the, relation, all the relationships. And I think about really, you know, it's hard to, it, when, can, you're paint, can, when you're painting, it's, when you're painting, it's hard because you're trying to paint something, you, you're painting something that you don't, trying to paint something new. So you don't really recognize it. You know what I mean? So it's very hard. So you're really in a zone because you, you don't, you're, you're trying to paint something that's, that you, you, why would I want to paint something I've seen before? So I'm always painting something I haven't, I haven't seen, seen before. Right. So it's, uh, and then you're sort of, you're, at the same time, you're sort of trusting yourself too. And so you're always, you're always like, you're, it's always doubt. It's always doubting where it is. Like, is the painting there or is the painting in my head? Like, where, where am I, where is the painting, you know? Yeah. So even for me, like, you know, like, I don't live with my paintings too much because for me, it's hard, it's hard for me to really live with my work because I'm thinking, well, I could, 
because I have it. I, I have it set up so that um, if I change the color, the whole thing falls apart. All these things are always moving. So I'm, when I look at a painting, I'm thinking like, well, I can make. The, I should. I could have made that red a little red, or why are those white marks? You know, I should have made the color more meat. So you look white. at the, you look at the inner craft. Yeah, I'm, I, I, get, I, get, see, I get around with the graph. So, but, uh, but where would you tell us? If, if I was seeing your work, this painting for the first time, where would you say is the first place I should look? I wouldn't tell you that. The only reason I asked that I question... I wouldn't tell you that, but I don't, I don't know. The only <laughs> reason I asked that question is because there was a time when there was a first place in the painting that oh, yeah. started from yes, painting. Yes, yes, yes. And but it that, tended to be that, the upper... But that, but that nothing to do with... I don't see that part to do with the viewer. That, that's... Um, yeah, that's true, but... You know, cause, uh, that's not really... Do you still do that, starting from the upper left-hand corner? I, I do, I do. I do. Why, 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 do you, why, why the upper left-hand corner? It just feels good. Are you left-handed? Sometimes. <laughs> 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 no, I am when I play. I am, because I do some left and right, but I, no, I don't paint left-handed. Have, you, but, ever but, tried, you know, have you ever tried starting from the lower right-hand corner? No, no, no. Because, you know, it's just what, like... What, what you know, would happen like, if you did? Uh, I have no idea, but it doesn't make any. It, that's not that's to me. That's not the issue because, you know, you do, you start off with things where where things. You know, I think artists. You know, probably you too as artists have certain things that you do. How you get into the studio, you know, how you how you work, you know, where you work, and so for me, it's sort of like it doesn't make a difference where I start uh, so much as it's sort of where I am. I just saw, I saw the top and working my way down. You know, when I was in Egypt, you know, looking at things, they, they work from the bottom up. They do. You know what I mean? They do, yeah. But I like the idea of the idea of gravity, you know, working the way down. It's so like a waterfall. I like the idea of things falling down and using, and using gravity. Now, that kind of idea, you know, when you're young, uh, you go around and look at all, all the artists and you think about what you can steal, what you can, mm. what you can, what you can get from every artist, you know? And if you're a really serious young artist, you really want to go out and study, look, 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 look. So for me, there's certain things, like say, if I'd seen about Morris Lewis, like, oh, gravity. Certain <laughs> things uh, I see from other artists, uh, different things, you know? And so, um, but in terms of how things feel, you know, that it's like I, in the beginning I start, I probably could do different things. Once, once I'm working, it doesn't make any difference to me. You know, once I'm working, I, I can... Once I'm working, I don't go across and then always go across that way. I can go anywhere because of whatever, whatever, whatever it needs. You okay. know, I do whatever it needs. If I figure that um, sometimes, I, sometimes I can go through the painting once and I can think that's it. Other times I go through the painting and I maybe go two, two or three times. Whatever it takes, whatever these, it takes. These are, these are what you call afternoon paintings. These right? are afternoon paintings. These are paintings that happen uh, because what I do, I, I, my, my power time, real when I work, you know, is in the morning, and I like, I like getting in the studio by 10 o'clock, working in the morning, and maybe by 2 o'clock, I'm totally exhausted. I can't work after 2 I mean, I'm, by 2 or 3 o'clock, I'm kind of done. And um, I've been listening to the same music for, when I work. Who, who do you listen to? I listen to this, uh, this uh, Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. I listen ah, to it all the right. time. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised I, the work I'm is. So, I'm surprised the work is so calm. If you listen to Bitches Brew. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. It, uh, and I've been having. I didn't. Re I didn't realize I've had it on for like maybe thirty years. <laughs> My goodness! Wow. <laughs> but that's, and it's, that's the longest painting soundtrack. In yeah. This yeah. Track. Exactly. <laughs> and I and I kind of uh, I get into a zone and I. Paint. And then uh, usually I'm working like if you saw the, if you saw uh, a freeze uh, the big paintings I usually work on a, I work on usually a big painting and then after that maybe a 96 or 72 or 80 by 80 and then after that I I have paint left over and um, it came off first with the 12 by 12 and then one time I ran out of 12 by 12 and I had a 40 by 40, and I said, I'll just paint that. Very He's quickly. going through the numbers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> numbers, the numbers. I don't think about numbers. And then I had a 40 by 40, and I just painted one of those very quickly. And I painted it with the idea, like, I would do these, I was going to make these paintings for me, and just do some real paint. I'd paint them, and I would, I would just sort of paint them, and then walk away. 
and not rethink them, not... So you paint them in one burst, as One burst and walk away, whatever happens, happens, and not go back in them uh, at all. So, so in a way, you're not painting them cold, you're painting them having, I'm as painting it were... Them, I'm painting them when I'm really in the zone. Exactly. I'm really exactly. in the zone. Exactly. Not until I'm, like, not until I'm really in the zone. Uh, but, you know, it's something, it's something I can do now because I've been painting for so long. You know what I mean? It's not something I could do when I was a younger painter. You know what I mean? It's something I can do now. And it's something I can do now, too, because I have a really big studio, and I can see things. I can walk around. My studio is bigger than this. So I can walk around. I can see everything. You know what I mean? I can just get to things very quickly. But, but the light is different in the afternoon from the morning. So The light the, doesn't make any difference. It, light no, makes no difference. No difference. Okay. I can paint in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I say that because, you know, you really... Have you ever painted in the dark? Close. No. <laughs> <laughs> because you really, uh, you really, you kind of feel them more than see them. I mean, you kind of feel your way through the paintings. It's not like you really, you, you know, I mean, my assistant gets mad at me all the time because I say, oh, wait till these go out, we'll really see them. She goes, and it's true, right? You know, and that's right. Because, like, I, I, I freeze. I go, oh, look at that blue. Look at that. Because in the studio, I can't see that blue so well. But I, when they go out, I go, oh, wow, look at that. But I know it's there. I, I can feel it. You know what I mean? So I paint in, like, like in Italy, my studio is sort of that kind of light over there. Very bad. bad. Like, like, that corner, it's, like, really, like, not very good. But I, I, I know it's there. I can feel it. So it's like... Um, uh, that's the way I do it. So it's, just, it's, so, it's, it's really so it's intuitive in a way. Huh? It's intuitive. It's, it's, it's intuitive. It's very, so, but it's intuitive because uh, it can be intuitive because I work so hard. You know, because I say so you've, much. Uh, you've earned the intuition for the yes, day. Yes, yes. So yes. really, afternoon painting is the, the heat of painting after the hotness of painting, right? Ah, that's a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You yes. know Duchamp had a, a set of conversations called afternoon conversations. I didn't know that. I'm not a real big Duchamp. I didn't know that. I'm not really a big Duchamp person, but I didn't know that. Yeah, it makes sense. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, he, he related the afternoon conversations to the, 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 the translogical. Mm, mm. Um, what does color mean to you? What does color? Life colors everything. Color, color is life. I mean, color is so many things. Color is sort of, um, color is like something people don't know much about. You know, color is, is everything. I mean, color is, is magic, you know. Color is good. gets into like, uh, who knows? I mean, that's the thing about color. It's so personal. You know, what's interesting about the, the paintings, because the paintings, because of the color, the color creates a conversation. Either when people buy the paintings, they, they like you can't show them too many because they'll get confused if they want to buy them. And you, and you know, because, but, I must uh, remember that. Yeah, yeah, because because you know, all of a sudden, people, because it's interesting, all of a sudden, oh, this green reminds me of this or this or this. All of a sudden, it gets very personal, and that's where the story comes in. You know what I mean? The story comes in with the people interacting with the paintings. It's interesting that way about the, the color. But color, and you can, you know, the way you can live with color and the way you can, uh, you know, quietly uh, engage with them, that's why I think they're really, I try to make paintings that are really about living with them, more, you know, living with them. Because you see them in the morning, you see them in the afternoon, you know, it's where you put it, you see it when you're feeling bad, you see it when you're sick, you see it when you're happy, so everything shifting, 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 shifting. Paul, uh, Clay and uh, Matisse both say, almost with an exclamation, that they became real painters, which is to say real colorists, yeah. when they went to North Africa. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was your North Africa? Well, I think when I went to Egypt, uh, but it wasn't so much color that way. I always, I always had the color. I mean, I always, I always, I, I, I had always, the color I always had. Um, when I was young, I went to a little art school in my hometown, and I was the only little black kid in the room when I painted, and they had a model, and we painted their face, you know, and I, I painted every color, you know, I, I painted every color, <laughs> like, I was 10 years old, and the teacher loved it, but everyone else's was like black and white and gray, you know what I mean, and the teacher loved it. 
And I was like, what the hell did I do? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I took it home. I said, my parents, I said, well, what's that? You know what I mean? I never went back. <laughs> I never went back. But I always had the color. The color was always there. But I didn't know, even through art school, how to make color subject matter. You know, I didn't know how to make color subject matter. I mean, I saw people use color, and when I came to New York in the 60s, people were using color, but I didn't even like their color. I mean, for me, uh, I didn't like sort of what I saw in terms of Nolan's color or, the, or Stella's color, people in New York school. I mean, I came out of New York school, you know, because I, I thought New York school was everything. Because when I grew up in Philadelphia, New York was where you wanted to be because of, you know, the jazz scene. And, yeah. And that seemed like New York, we got New York and then Paris. That was the idea. Uh, so um, the color was there, um, but I didn't know how to really handle it. You know, it took me a, it took me a long time to figure out where, you know, really. What was the turning point? The turning point, um, really making the paintings. God, it took me a long time. Probably was it '68? Was it? 81? 60, no, no, it wasn't 68. 68, no, 68, I didn't know where I was uh, I, uh, in the studio. No, it wasn't until maybe, I, I tell you, maybe late 70s, early 80s. I mean, I really, from, from art school from 64 to graduate school 72, I was just trying everything. And then when I got to New York 68, uh, then you saw sort of things like Barnett and Newman, people like that, which you couldn't do anything with. I was like, because I was interested in uh, the Spanish, the Goya, Velasquez, Velasquez. Uh, you know, and uh, all, you know, people you could really steal from. You know what I mean? In fact, I because, still because I still, they were far well, away. Yeah, now. well, no, because you could say, but I still think about that. Like I still think like, oh, if I look at a, a Goya, you know, he could Goya could paint, you know. A beautiful red slash. I go, oh, look at that red. I can steal that red. So sometimes I'll paint a painting and have a red slash and go, oh, Goya. You know? uh, so there are bits of Goya scattered there's good, there's good, there's bits of all, his, all art right. history in the painting. Right. I, want a, I want a system... But it's in the color. In the color. Right. I, want, I want a system that really allowed me to paint. Because, you know, you could look at, you could look at like a uh, Corbet or something and go, oh, look at that beautiful, you know... Uh, I don't know. You could but, say red. You could say red hair, or 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 or, or pink somewhere. But, so in these paintings, I I can paint like all kinds of things about painting. You know, all so these that could be like a pink from, or red or blue or gray from, Courbet. You know, I mean, or or, or Corot, anything. But all these people you mentioned are all figurative painters. No, but it's all what, paint. Yes, I know. It's all paint. I know, but at what point did you turn abstraction, and what does abstraction mean to you? Oh, total freedom for me. To, uh, you know, it doesn't make, to me, it doesn't make, I don't think of myself in terms of like, I mean, I think painting's painting. Like, I don't really think, it's a good painting, it's a good painting, you know? And so it's paint on canvas. So uh, I don't, your subject matter, you don't have much choice about, I don't think, as a painter. And do so. You, do you have a subject matter? Color. Ah, color. I thought so. You know, so uh, it doesn't make any difference to me if the painting is trees or, Figurative or whatever. It's just if it's a good painting, you know. In the in the 60s, um, the African American artist was expected, in a way, to, for want of a better phrase, be part of the struggle. Yeah. And to be part of the struggle, <laughs> and to be part of the struggle as a painter, um, figurative, because yeah. it conformed to the visual correlatives of society right. was the preferred mode. Yes. So you were, in a sense, a bit of an outsider and maybe even frowned upon. I mean, before yeah. you speak, I want to say, yeah. I'm saying this in great sympathy because in Nigeria, we had a, the same problem in a, difficult, in a different form. Yeah, yeah. The writer was supposed to write about social issues and yeah, supposed yeah. to attack yeah. governments. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and if you wrote a love story, you were betraying the revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, I was. I, I, I mean, I feel... I feel it's true, because I was even in the 60s. So how did you reconcile that? Because you're not indifferent to black issues. No, no, not at all. So how do you I reconcile? I can't be. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't want to be. No. Um, so how do you reconcile that? It was difficult, because, I mean, I, to me, I figure, like, I remember even in Kansas, I went to school in Kansas City during, during, you know, during the 60s, because I was in, in the Midwest on the, during the 60s, you know. Um, 
And that was like sort of a safe haven, but it was still really, I mean, I remember Wallace running for president when I was in Kansas City. So it was really like, you know, it was really, it was a, I feel like a pains in the war. I, that's how I look at it. And so the, the Black Panthers would come by and I would tell them, tell them I'm not here. I mean, because I'd be in the basement painting. <laughs> they go, where's Stanley? I'd say, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> because I couldn't figure out really how, to, how, I knew I wanted the paint, I knew I needed the paint, but I couldn't really justify, you know, my painting. Uh, like, sort of like Bar Baraka, Mary Baraka, he was someone who always sort of haunted me, you know what I mean? Because I thought, how do I faith in Mary with painting these paintings? Um, but then I realized sort of about mental health. I, I sort of realized it, but early on I couldn't defend my position. You know, I couldn't. I Could didn't you know defend it to yourself? Myself, I just knew I had to do this. You know, so I was, I, here I am, Kansas City's burning, Newark burning, and I'm painting, you know. But I think of myself, I think, well, I, and then, then I, go to the, I go to the image of Matisse painting in, in, in Nice with the Nazis down on the street. You know what I mean? and the importance of that act. Or even Matisse's paintings versus Picasso's Guernica. You know, that's something that still I think about. You know, because Guernica is such an important painting. You know, and such a, and, and Guernica, there's a great book that's called about Guernica, you know. Uh, and that painting is so important in terms of the 30s, you know what I mean, and the 40s, 40s war, all of that. And then Matisse painting these beautiful paintings, you know, in Nice. And so, where am I? Where am I in that position? And what's what is what? Are, how important are these paintings? But I knew that I had to had to do it. And so now people sort of you know now people still I, there's still an issues about that you know about in terms of struggle you know what, how important these are or what we're supposed to do or you know I call it the black police you know I mean the black police the careful. black aesthetic police yeah. Yeah. The black police are, yeah, we're going to come get you and, and defend, you know, defend your position. But I, I figure now, this, I mean, now I feel very comfortable about in terms of, you know, uh, how important the mental, mental struggle is, you know what I mean, for us, and what that offers us in terms of being, these paintings being able to, you know, give you the mental strength to uh, you know, get through things. You believe paintings can give you mental strength? Yes, yes. How do you think they do that? Um, I think it's like a, a like a good uh, like a good book, like a good piece of poetry. Poetry, you know, the need of that, you know, what that is. I uh, I think um, it's like it's like in some ways, it's also a young person can say, well, if he can do this, I can do this. You know what I mean? It's like I I, I just think that it's the, the capacity for, you know, if I sit down and read poetry, a great piece of poetry, you know, in the day, even before I get in the studio, what that is, or even after I get in the studio, what that is. Uh, it's just something, I don't know, you tell me. It just, it just gives me that strength. I, I noticed that you have this uh, uh, relationship with poetry, with music. You use poems. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're inspired by poems in yeah. your paintings. You like Rilke, Neruda, people like that. Um, music you work with, you've got this, the greatest soundtrack. Yeah. Painting soundtrack. Um, do you feel that there's this useful affinity between the arts. So you, do, you, do you feel that they speak the same inner language in different forms? Yes, yeah. So yeah. when you're inspired by, by, by a poem, um, is it the same way as when I'm inspired by your painting? I From hope. the inside of one's reaction to it and how it mediates with the world? I hope or so. Or do, do you have a different relationship with the different arts that you draw from? No, I'm, I'm inspired by those things. I hope uh, that, I think we're on the same page. Yeah, I think that's what I do, yeah. You teach as well? I used to. Ah. I, used to, I don't teach anymore. Why I did for a long time. When you taught, when you taught, was there, was there a fruitful relationship between teaching and, 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 and making art? Uh, you know, I taught uh, only because I could do that and it didn't, didn't get in the way of my painting, you know what I mean? Um, but, but that meant you either didn't do the morning painting or the afternoon painting. Well, then, then, then I didn't. No, then I didn't. I mean, teaching it took a lot of my time. I mean, teaching. When I, look, when I look back at that career, it was a good career. But I think, you know, basically, I think people tried to bury me uh, teaching. I mean, cause, because I think people were surprised what I got done. Because when I was teaching, 
full time. I was in, living in New York, driving to Philadelphia, teaching. I was chair of the department. And I think really, you know, I got that job in the, in the 70s, you know what I mean? Because in the 70s in the States, you know, they sort of went out and fought. I mean, I was lucky. I mean, when I came, I came, on, I came into the scene after King, you know what right. I mean, after Martin Luther King. And, when, and those, I think that before King and after King, you know what I mean? And so I came after King, where I was allowed to do something. I was allowed, and I wasn't as bitter as, or, or, or as mad as people before me, you know what I mean? Because I was allowed to be a painter. I was allowed to go to art school. They wanted me to go to, people were that way. I always say, people went to jail, and I got to go to Yale. You know, that, you know, stuff like that. And that's kind of what happened, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's, and, a, and, he's, and, he's, he's a rap artist as well. Yeah, he's a rap artist. Yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway but, but uh, that kind of, you know, I was able to do a lot, a lot of things because of that, that, that time. Um, just a couple of incomplete questions. Yeah. What's the color of Martin Luther King? Oh, wow. I have no idea. Every all the, I would, well, say, I would, I would I'm, say, I'm talking to you as a colorist. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I would say many colors, many colors, all the colors. I would say Martin Luther King, all the colors in the universe. I would say he's someone who really inspired for that. <clears throat> he was someone I think who great, great. I would say yeah, all the colors in the universe. Right now. I mean, I, you know, same question, <clears throat> Malcolm X. Same thing. Ma Malcolm, I think, Malcolm, I think, uh, you know, much more difficult life, <coughs> um, but is it, is he, it, Ma it, Malcolm, I think, probably would be, he'd be a little tougher about what colors. I think Malcolm would ask more questions about what colors, where King would probably would be more acceptable. But I would say, um, you know, a lot, a lot of color. Malcolm would definitely be more, more tough, tougher. It'd be hard to say about Malcolm. So if you were going to make a 12 by 12, um, what colors would predominate for Miles Davis? I'm just, Probably I'm just, red. <laughs> more, right. Bitches I, don't, I, I don't, see a lot of red in yeah, Bitches yeah. But, I don't, but I some don't deep blues as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, blues. Well, you know, they say when he played, he, he saw colors. You know, that's what they say. Um, Did you like his paintings? They're okay. I mean, you know, thinking about Ma uh, about Miles Davis, he wanted to be best of everything. You know what I mean? So uh, the paintings are okay. I mean, there's no time in them. I mean, he's a very he's a very you know smart, talented person, so he could paint. But the paintings, you know, like David had a few miles. I know. So you saw I was those? Just, just about to say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they're okay. But you know, he saw he saw Basquiat and thought I could do that. You know what I mean? So and he did. They're okay. No, no, you, they're not bad. You said somewhere that Basquiat meant a lot to the evolution of the status of the black artist in America. Do you still feel that? Yeah, yeah. And is that a continuous dynamic thing? He was very important. Basquiat was very important. He knocked down the race wall. You know, he flopped it down. Uh, and how he did it, I don't think he knew that, you know, what happened, but he opened the whole door. I don't think it was his intention, because I think he just wanted to be famous. But I think, you know, him, and, it, and the way he used Warhol was something no one thought about. Uh, so he's very important. Um, in your afternoon, I'm sorry, I didn't know him better. Did you know him at all? No, I, I kept my distance. Same with David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we kept our distance, but yeah. it was a mistake. Um, in your afternoon, he was too much on his own. I mean, the reason he died, he was too much on his own. I think that's why he died. He was too much on his own. Because he didn't have other black artists. You know, yeah, artists. I think he, he he didn't have that. Like that's one thing. Community. Dave, I think Dave and I used each other that way. Early on, we used each other that way. We both traveled together. We we decided we weren't going to be in one room together. We really used each other that way. We don't need each other that way anymore. But early on, we used like we would. You go, were like a community together. Yeah, we were a community. So we went somewhere for a show. We went together. Mm -hmm. We were always together. You know, so that you know, even you know. I was all, we were always did things that we decided to do that. We made a pack. We kind of made a pack. Uh, you know, there was me, Marina, David, and I. We always were together. We just went everywhere together. How is it? How does it feel painting in America today, with the kind of um, president you've got? What's the what's the what's the color? What's the smell? What's the air in the room? Hey, line? you don't want to go there. <laughs> the smell. <laughs> the smell is pretty bad. Uh, it's, it's tough, you know, but I, you know what, but you know, I, I, I say, but I, for me, see, for me, 
uh, being black men in America, I've always dealt with the smell. And I've always, I've always, I got paints, I painted the war before. So I'm, I got to paint the war again. If I got to paint the war again, I'll paint the war again. I've been there. I've always, I mean, I've always, I mean, I've always seen Newark or, or Chester, PA, or all these places in North Philly. It's always been bad for us. It's never been good. I've never seen it good. So it doesn't really, I'm not as upset because I, I, it's, it's always been bad. You know, it's, it's not something that's like, oh, this is happening. I mean, my parents, you know, they, they, they grew up in the worst time in America. For the worst time for black in America was after slavery. So from, from, from and so, Civil War to Martin Luther King, then, you know, I mean, all I got to do is go to the, 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 uh, that lynching uh, museum down in, uh, yeah, Alabama. I mean, you know, things were bad. This, for me, it's like I say, well, look, you know, I, I didn't go, 10 years old, I didn't go anywhere without my, my wallet, my passport, you know, because, I, you know, they, they said, where are you going? If I left my street, they said, where are you going? You know, wh wh why are you, wh where are you going? I couldn't take a step. Uh, two steps, they say, stop. So, you know, this is all, this is not new to me. It's just out there now, and it's bad, and, you know, I always tell, I tell, it, I tell, I, I tell people, welcome to Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's bad. Does it breathe on your paintings, the air of the times? Or, or, I hope so. Or, or I, I, I hope so. My paint, my, the paintings are strange. The paintings are strange. I think that's the thing about people. They're strange. They're not, they're, not what they, they're not what they seem to be. That's what's interesting about the paintings, I think. For me, even for me, they're strange because you can't describe. If you describe them, it doesn't mean much, you know. If you say, well, color is square, you know. It's nothing. It's not a great idea. Uh, they're strange. You know, you want that drama, that strange. S silly question. When is Whitney going to give Whitney a ex big exhibition, a retrospective? Yeah, well, welcome home, huh? Uh, when they have the nerve to welcome me home. You know, if they have the nerve to welcome me home. I think if my name is Basquiat, they might give me the show, but Whitney's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I want to. I, I, I want to open it up for one minute. I'd like to open it up for one minute, if it's possible. Does anybody here have any any questions they want to ask Stanley? Um, I have a question, actually. I have two questions, very short. Okay. Um, the first question is: When I look at your paintings, and I look like uh, the, the surface, they have different dimensions. Uh, there are some recurring geometric uh, like squares, right. and yet there is a level of freedom. It's almost like in um, a certain music from the 60s, Ornette and all that, where the question is, what tricks do you use to beat um, the, the, the repetition and predictability? Because you work within a very narrow aesthetic, and yet it's unpredictable, like a lot of free improvisation from Ornette music. Uh, the second Shall is... Shall we make it that, just that one question okay. to give others a chance, please? Uh, you know, that's, that's the idea, you know, to have something that's really, you know, to, to, for the drama, that's something I really work on, to have something that's really, these contradictions, lots of contradictions. So you can't really, because life is always, you know, nothing, you're all, we're all on thin ground, and that's sort of, sort of having that thin ground. So things are always... Um, you know, um, shifting and things are always, nothing's really, you know, you can say right, you know what I mean? So uh, the, the, system I, the system I did is so that I can go anywhere I want, whatever I want. You know, I don't have to wait for anything. If I want to put a blue down, I put a blue down. If I want to put a yellow down, I put a little yellow down. And that's very important. Um, so the this, this, this system I have developed over time, it wasn't like, I didn't, I didn't make a drawing and then add the color. The color made the system. Hi, first of all, thank you for being here and giving us this uh, opportunity to... What's the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, question, the question is, uh, you mentioned a couple times, I think only twice, actually. I mentioned um, what? You mentioned a couple times earlier that um, you, you look at like a Goya and you see, uh, I'm going to steal that red from Goya or something like that, right? Do you still steal from other paintings in that same way? Do you, or do you, not does as your relationship no, you with know, color now, change? Now, as I get older, not, not as much. I mean, I enjoy not as much as I, when I was young, you know what I mean? Uh, but, um, yeah, when I go, I go 
to, you know, say, uh, a museum and look at a painting. You know, it's great now I can go to a museum and look at one painting and go out and go home. Um, so yeah, I go and see things and go, oh yeah, that red, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that, use that red, but not as much as I used to. When I was young, I really was, there's a lot of paintings I wish I'd seen, a lot of paintings I wish I'd seen when I was younger that I see now that I don't need, I don't need, you know what I mean? I don't need, I don't remember really I the same kind of needs, you know? Because the older artists, you really want to, the big thing now is how do I keep this alive? You know, because I, you know, it's like keeping things alive. And you know, how am I going to feed it, keep it alive? But not as much anymore. Hi. Uh, do you have a paint without music? What? Do you have a paint without music? Do you have a paint without music? Uh, sometimes, but not that much. I mean, sometimes I do. Um, you know, it's funny. You know, when I paint with the music, you, you sort of become the music. You know what I mean? Not that you're listening to the music. You sort of become the music. So, um, you know, there's a story, there's a story actually, Marina to told in, in Kansas, in, in, uh, in Rome. I had a small studio I taught in Rome, and I would tell the students, don't bother me when I'm painting, you know? And, um, and I, I would, when I got there, I would, I would show them the door and say, look, I'm in, this is my studio. I said, if you have a question, and I'm in the studio, you know, don't bother me when I'm painting. If you, if you do slip something on the door, but don't knock on the door. If you do knock on the door, it better be important. And so, I, I, but I remember he said, oh, God, everyone knew when you were painting because the music blasts over the whole <laughs> studio. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I didn't know that. And um, I kind of start that way, but then I'm kind of in and out. You know, you, you're in a zone. You're in a zone. You, you, you work for that. I mean, you... you you, you're sort of thinking about the day before, I'm going to paint. I'm going to paint tomorrow, you know, and you prepare, you prepare. It's how you get in the studio, you know? It's how you get in the studio. And so I get in the studio, you know, I turn the music on, but, uh, you know, I'm there. I mean, I, I, can, I can even think I don't want to paint sometimes, but I have to paint. Um, and then when I get in the studio, I'm good, you know. You know. Well... It just remains for me to say thank you both very much. Thank you, Ben, for being such a gracious host. And it's been a real pleasure. And I, no, it's been a great I had pleasure. questions great I wanted pleasure. to ask you both, but um, we'll save them for afterwards because everyone's got stuff to do this weekend. And thank you, Stanley, for talking about the colour of struggle and drama and everything else. So just give these guys a round of applause, please. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Great.